Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris. Welcome to Life Questions, the place where you can get answers to your important questions about life from a biblical perspective. We've been taking a hard look at the questions you have been sending us, and so we want you to get pencil and paper together. We've assembled a panel of local pastors to address your questions during the next half hour. And I'd like for you to meet our guests. First, Dr. Tim White of the Lima First Missionary Church. Pastor Rich Bakey of the Delphus Trinity United Methodist Church. And um, next is Pastor Buck Sutton from the Living Hope Church in Lima and Pastor Patrick Kamler of Westminster Christian Church. Also happens to be a sports anchor here at uh, TV 44, so he's no stranger with us. Now, if you have any questions about life, we want you to stay tuned a bit later in the program. We'll be telling you how to contact us with your questions so that you can get some answers. Right now, let's get started with everyone. Welcome to the program. Mm. Great Pleasure to be here. here. Like you. Yeah. you know, we, we have a tragedy uh, yes. in this country with a hurricane down south. And it is, it is really wonderful and refreshing to see how a country that has had such a division over the last several months is rallying to people who need support, the Bahamas and down in Florida, South Carolina and the like. What is the specific role of the church in a natural disaster like this? We deal so much with the spiritual and the, the coming to Christ and things like that, but now we have people who once had and have nothing I mean, you know, whole neighborhoods have been wiped out. Yes. And many, in many cases, people are just the clothes on their backs. What's the role of the church in this? Well, Bill, I think we have to be Jesus to our community and to, the, to people. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they're Christian or non-Christian, uh, human beings. We have, to be, uh, we have to be Jesus and we have to minister to those people to the extent that we can. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's our duty. I think Jesus would want us to do that. When you say minister, what specifically do you mean? Well, resources, anything that we're able to do, anything that we are capable of, a lot of things that we can't do. But there are many things that we can do. Uh, assess the needs for, for one thing, and work through local agencies um, in order to get food, help uh, to those in individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's a variety of ways that we can help as, as we're, we're not handcuffed. Okay. And one of the things that it's interesting is that as Christians, you know, we might not all be able to go, just like sending somebody to the mission field, but we, but there's nothing that replaces boots on the ground, if you will, of yes. people doing disaster yes. relief. And right. even, I mean, we're talking about, you know, Dorian, but there are still people recovering mm -hmm. from Hurricane Katrina in 2005. Isn't that right. something? And the only people still on the ground there are Christians. Mm -hmm. Disaster relief, a agencies, Baptist Relief, Mennonite Relief, United Methodist Committee on Relief, all of those Samaritan's Purse, mm -hmm. all those organizations that have the faith perspective that say we're not going to give up on you. And so I'm proud of, you know, our church has done mission trips and I've been privileged to lead mission trips, take interns on mission trips. And, and it's when you show up to serve somebody for no other reason than you feel like the Lord uh, has blessed you and you want to be a blessing to others, it changes lives. It's interesting, Bill. I was sitting there thinking as, as we're going over this is um, in the Middle East right now, there are these refugees that are going into these countries. Uh, and when they go into that country, uh, the people that are in that country, they have the ability now to present the gospel to them in a, in a, in a foreign country, yes. which they would not have never been able to do unless they were refugees. Yes. And we look at refugees as a bad thing. But I wonder if it's this way with this natural disaster. Now you have people going to their homes and now they're wanting to hear, they, they want to listen. Where before you weren't going to that home, maybe you weren't invited. Mm -hmm. Now you're invited because you're coming and you're bringing help. That's a great mm -hmm. point. And you know what you see the church doing is if a church does bring people in, like I have friends that are still trying to put their, the pieces back together from Hurricane Michael last year. Mm -hmm. And you can see the church, you know, people that are coming in, but really you see the church that's in the area that is supported and kind of working with the, with the organizations that are there. And the point is that they stick around and pick up the pieces and help pick up the pieces long after the media is gone, long after all the mm -hmm. other helpful organizations that, that come in and they do a great job and, and they mean well and they do a lot of good. but then there's usually another disaster and they have to go and they have to do something else. So the church and the people that are on the ground are still there, still supporting their neighbors. They're the neighbors after everybody else leaves. And it's, it's good to see that 
that is consistently happening and that the church really is, you know, it's, it's your neighbors, it's the body of Christ, it's the people that are there mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. live among you. You know, we can send people, material resources down there, but really it's the, it's the body of Christ there that we can assist and we can help and that better in it for the long haul because mm -hmm. that's where they live. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I look at, at, at Christ as the perfect example because in many cases before Christ ministered on a spiritual level, there needed to be something naturally done, like a healing, for mm -hmm. instance, right. and he would address those issues before he tried to deal with the person's soul. And uh, I, don't you think that's a good role model that we can follow in cases like this? Where opportunities like hurt? this are things that we have to look for mm -hmm. as believers. Uh, we have to take advantage of the opportunities. We don't always get a, 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 an ear that is open. Uh, but when, when situations change, um, catastrophes hit, all of a sudden we now have an audience that will listen, as, as you had pointed out. Mm -hmm. And Christ, crisis times accentuate whatever is going on, whether it be dysfunction or health. In a crisis time, mm -hmm. you're going to see people mm -hmm. step up and be neighbors like they've never been before, and that's just accentuating their goodness. And you're going to see, uh, you know, families that are struggling with divorce or finances or whatever, you throw a crisis situation in, and it's going to accentuate. Always. All, mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. going to make it worse. And the mm -hmm. church is uniquely positioned that's right. to, to, to minister to these crisis in people's lives where all the other agencies that are giving food and water and they're critical things but they can't minister to a person's soul and help them solve mm -hmm. some of the deeper life questions. Bill, I know it's on your heart is when these things are happening now, should the, are, are these birth pains that we're seeing toward the end times and it should be motivating us like, hey, you know, we shouldn't be sitting back waiting. Now it's a time to go because we don't know how yes. long, much, how much longer we have. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Very good, very good. And, and when we live in a country that has had for the last several months division and, and strife politically, mm -hmm. socially over other issues, uh, this hurricane can, uh, hurricane can be a catalyst mm -hmm. uh, in a sort of a way to bring good out of bad, mm -hmm. do you think? Because yes. it can rally people together mm -hmm. beyond and above their cultural differences, their political differences because of the need of people and the need to show love. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the aspects of, of showing love is you show love and you do things for people and you don't expect anything in return for it. You know, mm -hmm. and you talk about um, addressing the physical needs before the spiritual needs. And, and I think that's right on. You aren't going to get anywhere if you're with a family and their house has been destroyed by a hurricane. And you say, well, you know, Jesus has a mansion for you in heaven. Mm -hmm. You know, just wait till you get there. You're going to have a great place. No, that doesn't help the here and now needs. And there's an opportunity for the church to do that, to seize on that. And if, if an open door is presented, you can present the gospel to someone, then, then absolutely you step through that door. But a lot of times, and I think all times really, uh, the church should and does step in and help people because it's the right thing to do. And we're following the example of Jesus. And the interesting thing that happens is every time I've led a team, whether it be Hurricane Katrina or I can in Galveston, Texas, or flooding in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or Hurricane Sa or uh, Superstorm Sandy on the East Coast. It's the people who go on the teams and the trips who allow Christ to use them, mm. who are changed more than yes, the yeah, people that you mm -hmm. work with. Because mm -hmm. all of a sudden, people are starting to connect. This is my faith in action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I understand what it means to allow the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit to use me and to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when we put that faith in action, it's not just an idea or we should help or we, you know, we send a check to some anonymous person, but when we're actually face-to-face -face with a person in need, it changes us. Mm -hmm. And isn't that God's way, really? 360-degree blessing, not right. just one-sided, never right. one-sided. And it minimizes our stuff, too. The things that we're worried about, the things that we're oh, stressed oh, out about, yes. that stuff mm -hmm. goes way down because we're able to, to spend ourselves in yes. service of something greater. Yes. And our joy factor goes way up when we're serving. When we're able to serve. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. right. Gentlemen, that's very good. We're going to pause and take a break, and we'll be back with more good discussion right after this. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion.
All right, we're back. And uh, we want to change our discussion now to another topic to address a question that has come in from our viewers. And that is the deliverance, uh, the difference rather, between faith versus religion. Mm -hmm. I think you wanted to tackle that at first. Well, you know, this is uh, something that a lot of uh, pastors are talking about now, and even a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a, um, all the, the numbers are saying that people going to church is going down. And, uh, you know, every main denomination, except just for a few, that their, their main, uh, you know, the churches are closing and, and things like that. And I, I heard a pastor say this one time that he said, the true remnant is coming to the surface. So there, there have been people going to church. Mm -hmm. There are people that they think going to church is, 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 is what the Lord's asking them to do. And then they think that that religion of going to a denomination, going to church, being good, maybe even reading my Bible, that that's gonna get them to heaven. And um, we know that, I mean, that's not it. I mean, that's, that's not the ticket, is going to church. So, you know, we kind of call it a spirit of religion to where you're just kind of um, doing the right things, but there's not a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. You're not spending time with Christ. You're, you're, your faith is, is, is not growing and, 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 and you know, not just, um, we all know the Pharisees, they knew the Word of God, mm -hmm. yet they did not have a relationship with the Father. And they didn't, they didn't have a relationship with the Son. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think right now we are in a time in, in history in the United States is God is trying to expose this, that just going to church isn't enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Well, and, and I think this is the hard part that I had to come to a realization a few years ago is that I was, as the pastor, was just as much a pro proponent of playing the game yeah. as anybody else. Yeah. Because I'd gotten sidetracked by, you know, the number of people in church or how nice our buildings were or how many programs we had going or what people were talking about mm -hmm. in our community if we were involved. And the reality is the scripture called us to make disciples. I think the church, the big C church, Christians, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. followers of Jesus, have to take ownership for the fact that we were called to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Right. Correct. And, and we need to engage in those personal one-on-one -on -one relationships or small group relationships where we're pouring into that next generation and we're helping them to live out their faith and not just you know, coasting in our own spiritual life where we're sitting back and checking the boxes if somebody shows up to church or so many people came to Bible study or we had an increase of this much giving this year. Right. Those are not indicators right. of spirituality. Mm -hmm. And, and it, if, unless the church is really willing to tackle that, you know, that whatever you call it, the remnant or the Christians who are, you know, are serious not to differentiate, but people who are genuinely wanting to follow Christ are going to have to rise up and realize it's our responsibility as ones who've been handed the baton from Jesus to the disciples and down through the generations to pass that on to the next generation. Well, one of the things like, you know, we, our churches are loaded with people. They just kind of talk about God. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like he's just up there. And, and, and as that conversation is going, is, you, can, you can sense that there's not a relationship. They just know about him. And um, how, how do we help people? Uh, you know, Tim, how do we help people acknowledge that, okay, something's wrong when, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's artificial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't get, <clears throat> excuse me, I did not get uh, religion when I came to the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank God I didn't. I didn't come to religion. I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Religion, though, can work hand in hand with faith in that religion is a means by which those people with like interests can come mm -hmm. together and fellowship their faith and, and, and explore their faith and, and exercise their faith. But faith is, faith is belief, faith is a loyalty, it's trust. Before I sat in this chair this morning, I had to have a degree of faith that it was gonna hold me mm -hmm. or I would never have sat down. Mm -hmm. and, and religion is just, uh, and that's my belief. I believe that very strongly that it would do that. But religion on the other hand, it, it's just a man-made uh, formula by which we can share that's our right. faith together. Yeah. And we don't come to religion, we come to a relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus Christ. Yeah. It really comes down to, you know, what is the motivation that we have 
behind what we do in church. You know, I, as we were talking about this, I was struck by, you know, James 127, pure religion and undefiled before our God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, that particular is talking about religion, but it speaks of motivation that I'm going to put myself second and I'm going to put the needs of others before me. Because a lot of times when we are doing religious things and it can be whatever it is in a church setting or even out of a church setting, we're just doing religious stuff. It's to make ourselves feel better, to make it feel like, you know, if I do this or if I tithe or if I show up to church once or twice a month, I'm going to feel a certain level of comfort. God is going to smile upon me and I'm going to feel uh, you know, holier than, than, than I really am. But it's not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be, you no, know, what can we put ahead of ours? How can we serve God today? How can we show that we are a follower of Jesus, that we are the body of Christ? That the hurricane discussion we had earlier kind of ties into that. Mm -hmm. How else do we serve in our community? How else do we serve others and put others before ourselves? That's the, that's the faith. And I think also going back to James, that's the religion that God wants us to see, not that we're just doing the same stuff over and over again, but that we're actually his hands and feet out in the world. Buck, you, you'd mentioned earlier about you know, you do a lot with teens and mm -hmm. teen ministry. And what, what do you do when these teens are getting ready to go off to college and all of a sudden they're not around mom and dad anymore? How do we make sure that they have that sincere faith connection where it isn't just, hey, I've adopted the religion of my family. Right. I've played the game. I've checked yeah. the box. I've right, gone right. to youth group and Sunday school and church <clears throat> and, and I'm a good kid. I do the right things. I right. don't do the wrong things. How do they have a vital faith going into that, um, you know, secular world? Well, let me maybe backtrack a little bit. One of the most dangerous things that can happen to a teenager is when the parents are in, they're just playing the religion game. That is one of the most dangerous things because- What do you mean by that? Well, what that means is what we're talking about. They don't have a personal relationship the, the with- The kids can spot the phone. The, yes, yes, yes. And then what, what they're picking up on is, it's just, it's just a, it's, it's, a, um, it's a lifestyle of um, an image that you project. Yeah, doing the right thing. You know, just you, you just kind of talk about God and he doesn't dominate your life. He, you know, you're not like uh, loving him with all of your mind, soul, strength, and, and, and you're not doing that. You're not surrendered. You're, you're just, you just have God in this really small box. And, and that is very, very, you, when that happens, you're leading your child and your grandkids away from the Lord. Even if you're hyper involved in church. Yes. And you serve as a deacon yes. on the board and you yep. do all those things. Yeah. So, so you know, the number one uh, influencer in a child is the parents. It's, it's the honest it. God truth. I mean, you can, we, we, we've, you know, all the research, all the studies go back to that number one influence is the parents. Not that, that, that students cannot, uh, you know, uh, come above that and be overcomers in Christ, but, um, but when a, a child sees that the parent's faith is real and they, mm. they, they can sense it, they know it, and they see God moving in that home, that's when, they're, that's when the child's like, this is real. Yes. Well, let's take this to the, to the next level. <clears throat> what about when a child goes off to college and he has come up in the proper environment and the like, and now he's dealing with professors on the college campus who are saying there is no God, uh, yeah. that, that, it's, that it's the theory of evolution uh, that we are to uphold here. Mm -hmm. And that there has to be a separation uh, because this is an educational institution, so we can't deal with uh, promoting one religion over another. Mm -hmm. There are, I know, certain programs in existence around the country that help to prepare Christian young people for college so that when they get on the campus, they'll be able to deal with a professor that's trying to talk them out of their religion. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're living in that day and time. How do we prepare these children? Well, How I think do we one make of the things sure? to, to be aware of, and, I, and I, it took me, I'm a slow learner, so it took me halfway through my master's of divinity degree to figure this out, but they weren't there to teach me. They were there to challenge me. They, meaning the professors, the professors? Uh -huh. they weren't there to teach me. They weren't there to give me the answers. Uh -huh. They were there to help me to become a learner myself, a lifelong learner, where as you're pursuing a degree, it's not about them imparting information to you. And some, some do that and some try to indoctrinate because there are bad professors, there are good professors. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. their primary purpose as an educator is to challenge you 
so that you are more steadfast and sure in your own beliefs. Yeah, but if that it, you're but, able to defend those. But if it comes to a point where they're saying we have to deal with the laws of science, and in some cases those laws conflict with the laws of your faith, uh, how do you how, how do you prepare a student to deal with that? Because they're going, to, they're going to say, some of them, like you said, we're not saying that all professors are bad or anything like that, but some are going to say, how can you prove God? You can't see him, you can't touch him and feel him. Um, these are some very practical things that can disarm a young person who has come out of, uh, who has come out of a, a Christian home setting now going off to college and get a degree so that he can uh, become a productive citizen in life. Well, the doctor might have more insight than I do, but th what I tell my folks is, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. Christians have no need to fear truth, whether, wherever it comes from. Well, truth is right. truth. But if you're and dealing if, with if, a young it, person but, but it, but if that there, isn't armed like a full-grown adult and is hearing that, well, how does the child combat that? You, I think you're talking about a mature Christian. No, I'm saying talking if about, a professor pr gives a point, Yeah of this is created. There's plenty of research, there's plenty of places to go to find contrary information from a biblical worldview that supports the Christian point through science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And any person who's writing a basic paper could present two sides. Okay. Well, and I think too, we are living in a time period that has, is, is, is best to equip that. We have a lot of great uh, uh, ministries on campus now at every major uh, secular university mm -hmm. that these students can get plugged into. And we have technology now for those praying mothers mm -hmm. and those praying fathers, as, you know what I mean? That they can be sending their child all kinds of Bible verses. They can be sending them, um, you know, podcasts. Hey, listen to this. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can stay engaged. And, you know, to, I would say the number one thing, I mean, besides what you have laid the groundwork when they were younger, is to get a praying team of people to pray for your child while they're at school. You know, I, I have mostly a, a combative former atheist answer, I guess, for this particular <laughs> question. But one of the things that I consider when, and, and, and again, I, I dealt with this in college and kind of going through it was, and I'll, I'll, I'll try and be nice because we're on television, but what is the authority of the person who is telling me this information, you know? You can suggest that the earth is a certain number of years old, okay? You weren't there when it was made. Ultimately, <laughs> you're relying on what someone yeah. else wrote, what right. someone else has discovered to draw that conclusion out. So I can look at that and go, okay, well, that is a, that is a valid conclusion. You've got some facts to back that up. You know, and if you're particularly someone who thinks that the earth is 6,000 years old, there's stuff that to back that up. The point is not necessarily on who's right or who's wrong in that particular regard. It's, am I allowing this person, whoever it is, professor, you know, teacher, other students, whatever, to have an undue amount of authority and influence on what I think, feel, and believe as a follower of Jesus. And I think if you're allowing that, mm. that's the thing that you need to, I guess, check against and, and provide against, you know, arm your kids with critical thinking skills, mm -hmm. allow right. them to ask harder right. questions and think outside Absolutely. the box so that when that, when those things happen, when you have someone who, I don't know, just coming up with an example, comes in your dorm room when you're in college and says, well, I think the aliens are the ones who planted us here. You can kind of dismiss that with the, with the hyperbole of which it was meant to be dismissed with and move on about your day. But I, I think just being able to, you know, have that resource available is, is extremely important, at least in my view. And I think that reinforces the whole point of having faith and not adopting yes. religion. Exactly. Yes. We, we don't, exactly. we don't exactly. check our brain at the door no. because we're Christians. Right. God gave us this mind, this intellect, this reason. Mm -hmm. And when the faith is our own, the Holy Spirit guides oh, us. Right. And we don't just blindly accept what somebody else taught us, whether that's from the pulpit or whether that's in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. I have dealt with unbelieving professors, believe me, uh -huh. many. Um, I still remain true to my convictions. And um, they can take that or they can leave that, but my convictions remain the same, didn't change. I, I think the question though was really how do we prepare them? Yes, that's what I'm going to hear. How, yeah. do, how do we prepare them? Yeah. At it, home it, and it, in the church, at, at home by the way. The church, it, doesn't, it doesn't start at the freshman level of right. college. Right. No. You've got to go way back. You begin to groom them in the church. You begin to groom them at home. Then you have to trust 
that their faith, not yours, will carry them through college and through all kinds of challenges. I Make really love the point that Rich, okay. Pastor Rich made in, in terms of um, how, how how, how, to, how, to, how to combat that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you make the distinction between, and I like your distinction though, I like your, your, your phrase, phraseology. How do you make the distinction between the child's faith or their parent's faith? Mm -hmm. I, I assume you're saying that some kids may be going to college with their parent's faith mm -hmm. rather than having the personal experience themselves. Or parents are sending their children with their faith. Mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. opposed to their own. Yes, what I'm saying. And is mm -hmm. my faith enough to hold them? And that's, that's the anxiety and the worry. That's where we get into the problems of uh, how do I let my ch child go? You have to understand you can't let your child go if it's going to be your faith. At some point prior to their freshman entrance, mm -hmm. you, have, you have to understand that either they have faith or they don't. Right. Yeah, and, right. and you have to have prepared them prior to the step, them stepping onto that to college grooming. campus. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I would sit there and say to, to parents is, when that child does leave, and you know, they just left just a few weeks ago, when they leave, don't disengage. Don't, don't sit there and say, hey, good luck. They need to stay engaged, you know, and, and the phone calls, the text messages, the, the uh, I just got on Marco Polo, and it's amazing, where you can send a video message, you know. Uh, sending the Bible verses, yeah. sending, you know, I mean, uh, asking them how things are going and not being overbearing with it. In essence, a care, a care package is what yes. my Marco kids Polo. want to college. Marco Polo, is that something like Snapchat? Or? Oh, it's amazing. Oh, you need okay. to get it. I gotta but, get into it. But I think you made an interesting point. The, the nature of the relationship changes. Yes. And it doesn't matter if they're going off to college or they're getting married or they're going to the workforce. That's right. The reality is when kids leave the house, now all of a sudden we're their their counselor and advisor and we're their friend, we're not, we're not the overbearing parent who right. makes all the decisions. And praying, like you said oh, earlier, that's, our role shifts yeah. to making the decisions for them, what they can and can't do, to trusting that they're gonna make wise decisions yes. and, and letting them be comfortable. I don't know about you guys, but I messed up pretty bad when well, I left home well, and I didn't always get it right. Sorry. And, and part of it is we have to be comfortable with them making mistakes yeah. and then talking through them like adults. Do you want to do that again? Is that the outcome that you want to have? Maybe there's a better way to do this as opposed to scolding them like they're a two-year-old yeah. because you told them not to put their hand on the stove. And, and this was an eye-opener for me is they're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. It's not, it's not going to be like, wow. You know, it, it's gonna happen and you cannot overreact. And God reinforces the idea that he is able to keep all that we commit unto him. Yeah. All, that's even our children, everything from the small to the big, he is able to keep that uh, when, we, when we stay in tune with him. Mm -hmm. And you just, you, you create those opportunities and you find those opportunities that before they leave the house, as you said, you know, this starts way before freshman year, that they can take ownership of their faith, that they can see God work, not just in the lives of their parents, but they can see God work in their lives in their life. personally yes. as well. No, yes. All right, gentlemen, we're gonna have to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Very good discussion. I certainly hope we've helped a lot of people today with uh, the broad array of uh, conversation we've had. And yes. We will be back again next week at the same time. So I encourage you to send in your questions and be tuned in next week so that, we can, so that you can hear your answers. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you. Bye-bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, 
Share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at wtlw.com.